Hi again, everybody. Welcome into another edition of the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. Thank you for joining us today on Apple, Google, Spotify, however you may be listening and watching on the YouTube page, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast on YouTube. Thank you again for making us a part of your day. Episode 143, Facing an Ace, Volume 2, talking today about Sandy Alcantara. We did this with Justin Verlander weeks back, Volume 1, so I invite you to go back into the archives and listen to that show, but today we're doing Volume 2, Miami Marlins right-hander Sandy Alcantara talking about him with his repertoire some hitting plans and approaches that hitters would take or could take at the major league level in facing Sandy who's not having the greatest of year but he is still an ace and we will talk about Alcantara here today so let me bring in professional evaluator successful business owner my former coach current day renowned coach friend and co-host Jake Epstein good morning Jim How's the microphone over there? I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> Trying to tighten her up. <laughs> Just get her tightened up and locked in. I don't even have a microphone arm. I have a simple microphone stand, and I just prop it up and just go. Well, that's why you're a professional. Well, I would actually say the opposite for you. <laughs> you you actually have it professionally done on a mic um, arm there. I don't. I just have simple, simple. You know me. I like everything simple. For those new listeners... I like everything simple. For our old listeners, they know I'm a simple guy. I like, you know, the KISS method. Keep it simple. I like it. Silly. Keep it. I replace Silly. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> All right. Volume two today of um, Facing an A, Sandy Alcantara. I, I got to ask you, though, about um, mm -hmm. something really quick. And we haven't brought it up in a long time. <laughs> but I'm going to bring it up now with the pitch clock. All right. Mm -hmm. I have a theory. Not really. I'm not really going to ask you. More get your opinion on it. But I have a theory about the pitch clock. And certain teams that have done really well in the beginning, but are starting to tail off a little bit. I'm wondering if the pitch clock had something to do with that. And I point to Juan Soto, who got off to a little bit of a rough start, couldn't really get into rhythm at the plate. And once he finally got the pitch clock and the pace of the game down, he's starting to hit again. And, and we're seeing the Juan Soto that we're familiar with seeing. And I'm wondering with some teams, younger teams, with guys coming up to the minor league, seeing the pitch clock and having to work with the pitch clock and that type of pace of game at the minor league level for so many years, the younger teams, the Pittsburgh mm -hmm. Pirates of the world, who yeah. still have a shot to make the postseason. I'm not putting the Orioles in that category because I've said from the beginning, I think the Orioles can make the postseason. But those younger teams that got off to really good starts, the team that I'm pointing out, the Pittsburgh Pirates, younger guys that came up through the minor league level, Working with this pitch clock, I'm wondering if the older teams that got off to slower starts or teams that have veteran guys like the New York Mets that got off to slow starts and are still almost trying to find their footing, especially at the plate, if the pitch clock had something to do with that because they were so used to a pace of play, a certain pace for so long, and now things have changed with that pitch clock. And I'm wondering if it had to actually do – actually, I'm not really wondering. I'm thinking it has to do with some of the results that we're seeing in the early going, both individually and team throughout baseball. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic you brought up. I, I think it's – it it needs uh, – we need to – we need to write a, a paper on this. We need to do a study on this because um, I think you've raised some good points. Um, hitting is about comfort. Yeah. We have to be comfortable. If there is stress involved when we're hitting, we aren't going to perform. If we have a baseline swing, if we have a, a kind of a baseline heart rate, and obviously it's always going to go up. But if we practice at a certain level with limited stress, and then all of a sudden we have all these external factors, right? We have fans, we have runners on base, we we have pride in our team and our teammates. You know, we don't want to let them down. We have a pitcher who's trying to get us out versus maybe a, even a high velocity machine. We're going to break down a little bit, right? Yeah. And so now all of a sudden you have another factor of of stress. Now I got to look at a clock. Now I got to make sure I don't step out of the box. Now I got to get one foot in the box. Now I got, and they've been doing this for years. Um, I think you bring up a very valid point with with guys that were out of their comfort level. And all of a sudden, hitting's hard enough as it is. You know, we're, we have a plan. We're trying to stick to our plan. You know, maybe we have one thought, and that's tunneling a certain pitch or looking in a certain zone or looking for a certain speed. And now all of a sudden, we have two variables going on with a pitch clock and making sure I'm in the box at the right time. Um, that's tough. I always tell players, you know, when we're learning hitting – it's you know think of it as juggling if we're thinking about something with our back foot or our back hip 
but we're also thinking about something with our upper body, maybe our making sure we're our top hands cock, we're not casting or something like that. And then we're also making sure that we're extending through with our top hand. So now we have three, think about juggling three balls, right? That's that's pretty hard unless you're a good juggler, especially if you've never juggled, that's impossible. But what if we just think of one thing? What if we just think about, hey, I want to think about my top hand here finishing through the ball a little bit more. Well, I can juggle one ball. And so that's kind of the process of a hitter is, you know, we have to limit these thoughts when we get in the box. And and obviously when you get a pitch clock and you don't want to get rung up with two strikes in a pressure situation when, when, you know, base runners are at a premium. Yeah. I think it did mess with a lot of guys and the younger guys have been doing it for a couple of years in the minor leagues, like you said. Um, so they're going to get a head start, but I, I think we're going to get to a point after the halfway you know, part of the season after the all-star break when, when everybody's kind of locked into it. Well, we're seeing it now. Juan Soto's getting blocked in again. Trey Turner, by the way, is another guy who's yeah. really off to a bad start in, in Philadelphia, his first season there with the Phillies. And I mean, he's always been someone to me that I've looked at as just steady, right? Somebody you, yeah. you know you're going to get day in and day out. He's not going to swing at too many bad pitches, but he's swinging at a lot of bad pitches this year, really fishing out of the zone. And I think some of that has to do with the pitch clock. I mean, Trey Turner was a guy who, because he's so athletic and he can do so many things and he's so dynamic on the field that he almost creates his own pace of play in his mm -hmm. own head. Mm -hmm. Well, that goes away now that you have the pitch clock at the plate. He's not struggling so much in the field, but he's not the Trey Turner we're used to seeing. And I don't think it's an age problem. I, I've always said with him, he could be 45, uh, yeah. 48, 50 years old and still be really athletic and really fast. I think the pitch clock maybe for him that adjustment period, trying to get towards that pace and play that way with that pace has been a little bit of a struggle for him. Yeah. And Philly's tough, you know, as the yeah. first, first year in Philly, he didn't have a problem in LA, you know, LA is a massive yeah. market. Well, they didn't have the pitch clock though last year. That's they didn't. And they, and they, and they also, the LA fans aren't like the, the Philadelphia fans, you know, like he, <laughs> those are real baseball fans in Philadelphia, the LA fans, right. They show up in the, third and leaving the seventh right they're just there for the they're there for the entertainment and the good weather man and you know maybe a cold beer and a dodger dog so i i do think there's there's some of that you know he's trying to prove himself he signed a huge contract and again mm -hmm. external variables and if we can limit those obviously the pitch clock that nobody had any control over that that was just put on you know everybody that steps on a field but external variables regardless of what level of play you're at you know, maybe you're on a you're on a travel softball team, and you know you you have um, you know a coach you're trying to please, right? Or there's all of a sudden recruiters in the stands, or whatever it might be. And if you swing at a bad pitch, and the coach you look down at third base, and the coach has bad body language, and you're like, oh, geez, boom, I, I guess I messed up there. Well, maybe it was a great swing, oh, and you just fouled it off. Yeah. So you know, we all have these different things, and you have to put yourself in the right environment to succeed. Um, and I think we'll talk about that, too, when we're facing A's. You have to put yourself in the right environment for you, knowing yourself and what kind of hitter you are, to be successful. Yeah, so today, talking about facing an ace, volume two, Miami Marlins right-hander Sandy Alcantara. If you have any questions, please email us to jimbopodcast21 at gmail.com. Going through his repertoire really quick, Sandy Alcantara, fastball 96 to 98. He throws that the most 53% of the time. Mind you that he has three pitches. Mm -hmm. And for a guy who's an ace, I know he's having a rough year. He's off to a rough start. Pitch clock may be, mm -hmm. may be factoring into right. that, by the way. <laughs> but for a guy who's an ERA over five, I still consider him an ace. And every fifth day or fourth day, whatever, fifth mm -hmm. day, that's a he's a bear. He's one of these one is that pitcher that's really tough to face. It's not easy. It's not an easy day. Not no stroll in the park, so to speak, when you're facing Sandy Alcantara. But his three pitches that he has, they're pretty evenly distributed. Fastball, 96 to 98, 53% of the time. Change up, 89 to 91. He throws that 26%. And then the slider, 88 to 90 at 21%. Not sure you and I discussed this off air. I'm not sure he has a true, some people would disagree with this, but that's fine. True, mm -hmm. true out pitch. Mm -hmm. He's a guy who, I, I look Could at the fastball. velocity. I look at the fastball. <laughs> I look at the change up. Uh, he's kind of a power pitcher in a yeah. way and he's got some sink. He does have, he does mm -hmm. have a sinker, a fourth pitch that he mixes with the fastball, but that fastball has a lot of sink to it. But for a guy who has three pitches and you're formulating as a hitting coach now at the major mm -hmm. league level, formulating a plan for your hitters, just an overall interchangeable type 
plan mm -hmm. for your hitters facing this guy. Three pitches, you would think, okay, it's not too tough. It's not, we're not doing something here scientifically having to go right. deep into numbers when right. we're creating a plan how to beat Sandy Alcantara that night. And you have to understand the night too. So your plan may change throughout the game, depending on, and, and we're, we're using him as a, our example, but we could use, we could use any ace as an example. We could use whatever Scherzer, Verlander, or whoever you want to throw out there. Um, we don't always have our best stuff. Right, pitchers don't always have their best stuff. Their aces because they can get through the days that they aren't great, right? But I would say maybe a third of the time they're not going to have their best stuff. If they have their best stuff, they're going to beat you. Okay, that's why they're aces. You know, hopefully they make a mistake somewhere. They make two or three mistakes a game, and we can capitalize on them. Um, maybe we work counts a little bit more. Um, but we have to find a way to, to get on base against those guys. So typically with, with him, if he's a, just a three pick pitch guy, I'm, I'm probably going to, I'm going to have a fastball approach. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to try to find that fastball. I'm going to try to tunnel a fastball in a certain area. Um, you know, maybe middle away. How does he usually pitch me? Does he usually pitch me middle away? Does he usually pitch me middle in? I'm going to tunnel that area where I think I can be successful on his fastball. If I'm a right-handed hitter and he's running that fastball down and in on me. I don't want to look in. I do not want to look for an inside fastball bearing in on me because he's going to, he's going to beat me. It's going to run in on my hands. I'm going to get jammed. So I'm going to maybe look low and away. Maybe I'm going to look low and away for a fastball and that changes my sight. So then if anything's kind of running up or running in, I'm going to have a better chance to lay off of that. So we can use an example um, with the, the College World Series, um, Jordy Ball with Oklahoma was just masterful in her her pitching and just deadly running. Rice Ball just pounding the hitters up and in, up and in. And the angle she was creating to get the pitch there was was difficult. Like those hitters were not going to be successful hitting that pitch. So sometimes we, we have to change our sights 180 degrees on what that pitcher is doing. If, if she's pounding in and up, and we're swinging through it, we're swinging under it, or we're swinging um, over it if it's a you know power, if, if somebody's throwing like a screwball in there, but you know she was riding it in, then I need to look at something completely different. I'm not going to hit that pitch. Like, And if I do hit that pitch, I'm going to get jammed or I'm going to pull it foul. So I need to find a way to lay off that pitch and get ahead in the count. And sometimes that's the best way to do it is to look 180 degrees. Again, this is pitcher dependent, but 180 degrees with what that pitcher is doing. And then I'm not going to fall in the trap of chasing that pitch that that pitcher wants me to hit. Okay. If they want me to hit, um, you know, if say Alcantara's throwing, he's throwing sliders away, sliders away, sliders away, or vice versa. Say it's a left-handed hitter and a right-handed pitcher and they're pounding sliders down and in, down and in, down and in. I'm going to tell maybe low and away is not the pitch I'm good at. Okay. I am not a great low and away hitter, right? Most people aren't. But if I look low and away, and he's not trying to throw it there all the time. Okay, so if he's trying to throw the ball low and away and I look low and away, I'm going to swing at balls, right? I'm going to chase. But if I'm looking low and away and he's throwing the ball down and in, but all of a sudden that pitch starts in a tunnel on the outside part of the plate, I know it's hittable, right? It might not be on the outside corner. It might be right down the middle and I'm going to jump on it. So we have to kind of use our, our experience or as Jim likes to say, wisdom on, you know, how do we approach? That's why approach is so important. Okay, now approach doesn't work if you have bad mechanics. Okay, so that's why mechanics, 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 when you're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, like make sure your swing is solid and adjustable. So that way when we're older, then we can just focus on approach and covering different parts of the strike zone and, and different speeds. And the only way to have a chance against an ace is to have a good approach. That's the only way. If you just go in the box blind, oh, this guy's got pretty good stuff. I'm going to try to swing at a fastball early in the count, then you're going to end up probably swinging at change-ups, right? You're going to start chasing. So you have to have a plan. Does he throw change-ups early in the count? And does he finish with fastballs late in the count? You know, what is the trend? What is the tipping trend? If you look at his 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 pitch breakdown, right, it's perfect. You know, essentially it's 50, 25, 25. That's about as good as it gets, right? With a power fastball, that's as good as it gets. And so you can't sit and his changeup moves one way and his slider moves the other way. So you, you can't sit there and, and, and guess, right? So you stick with the percentages, fastballs, where do I want to hit that fastball? Boom, I'm going to look low and away, or I'm going to look away, or I'm going to look, probably not going to look in because then his sliders, meaning if you're a right-handed hitter 
and a right-handed pitcher, and you're looking in all the time, you're going to get beat with sliders away. Okay, But if I'm maybe looking away off him for a fastball away, I can time up that fastball away, and then if it's a slider and I stay through it, I still have a chance on it. So Sandy Alcantara, he's got three pitches here, and we mentioned fastball, changeup, slider. I read an article this morning on Sandy on the ringer, and he talked about how he likes to throw, if say, two four-seam fastballs, he likes to come back with two two-seamers, which is considered his sinker. The numbers don't dictate that. Again, throws the fastball, the four-seamer, mm -hmm. 53% of the time. He doesn't throw the sinker all that much the numbers or the I'm getting computers from, aren't picking I'm up a big these, difference right right computers i'm getting these from too. baseball savant .com, mm -hmm. but i'm wondering now though because he does have that sinker in his repertoire he has that in his toolbox if you're a, a hitting coach formulating a plan against sandy on that every on every fifth day when you're facing that ace with the sinker being part of his toolbox how are you going about creating a, a plan and an approach for hitters just an overall broad approach for hitters now versus a Sandy Alcantara, say, who's got three pitches. Yeah. So You're facing a guy who's got four pitches with the sinker. Yeah. You you want to obviously look at, I mean, you can get crazy. And so I'm going to look at video and see if his arm slot, where his arm slot is on those two different pitches, you know, yeah. see if there's a vast difference to give, give our guys, you know, maybe a little bit of a, a chance, a uh, recognition chance. If, and does he throw a sinker for strikes? And does he throw his four seam for a strikeout pitch? So for me, I'm just, I haven't seen him pitch enough, but you know, you're using your sinker to get soft contact, right? You're, right. you're, you're, you're starting it off on thirds of the plate and letting it run to the corners. Um, and then maybe you're using your four seam fastball to elevate in the zone to throw a, you know, letter high fastball or a belly button high fastball to put somebody away, right? Maybe you throw two sliders low and away, boom, now I'm just going to go middle of the plate. I'm going to go at the belly button. I'm going to blow a four-seamer by that player. So I, I would have to know more in how he uses his pitches. You know, what pitches does he use to get ahead in the count? Sometimes they're just flips sliders early in the count. I was watching the um, TCU uh, baseball regional um, and just flipping early, early breaking balls over the plate. Uh, and then in the third inning, one of the TCU guys, they were playing Indiana State, uh, which was awesome, by the way, that they're in a super regional. But it's the third inning, and uh, one of the TCU players, I can't remember his name, but he hits an o, o slider out of the park for a home run to get on the board. It was like the second time through the lineup. So he had sit, he had sat, or his coach is, you know, a bright guy and was charting everything and figuring out. But he was seeing that this guy was just throwing sliders early in the count. One of the first two pitches is a hanging slider. I'm going to go ahead and sit on that slider. If it throws me a fastball, I just take it, right? Not in position to hit that. But if he throws me that hanger, I don't have to make, make an adjustment. I'm going to sit on that, whatever it is, 84 mile an hour speed instead of 92. And boom, he got his team going and they built momentum. And then um, I think it was two batters later, the guy got a fastball, oh, oh, down the middle and hit a home run on the, on the, on the first pitch. So sometimes, you know, by doing that, now all of a sudden you're changing the other team's thinking, right? They're going to do the same thing. If they're successful with it, they're going to keep doing it until you prove to them that, you know, you're a little bit smarter and you can take advantage of it. And that's kind of what happened in that TCU game. And they were able to put up three and, and get the momentum. So sometimes having a plan, that kid had a plan. I don't know if it was the team plan. I don't know if it was his plan from just sitting on the bench and watching how the, you know, the, the opposition was pitching him, but he had a plan and he stuck to that plan and boom, it probably broke the ice and got them that first game of the super regional bid or super regional win. So with, with Sandy Alcantara, mm -hmm. with his, just to add more context, according to Baseball Savant, with his slider, mm -hmm. he gets with two, and this is with two strikes now, and we're kind of breaking down more scenarios here. With two strikes, he gets hitters at the bottom of the zone, below the knees, to swing 68 to 71% of the time, depending on where the pitch is, east to west, inside, yep. or out. So as a hitting coach, and that's a ball, by the way. Yeah. Even if it's a liberal umpire who loves to call high strikes and low strikes, it's still a ball, <laughs> still a according ball. to BaseballSavant.com. As a hitting coach, you see those numbers. Now you're saying to yourself, okay, I can tell my guys with two strikes, a pitch, a slider that might be coming to you when you're down in the count, 0-2, 1-2, 2-2, whatever, that slider 
major league hitters across baseball, they're swinging 68 to 71 percent of the time at that pitch that's below the zone, out of the yeah. zone. I can tell my hitters now, hey, see that slider out of a certain window, out of a certain arm slot. Let's watch some video together so we don't swing at that slider that's not a strike with two strikes and get yourself out. Yeah, and you'd go a step further and say, how many two strike sliders are in the zone? Mm -hmm. Right. So how many how many times with two strikes does he throw a slider? If it's 15 or 20 percent, maybe it's worth um, not swinging at sliders. Right. You have to play the percentages as a as a hitter. You know, um, the other thing you can do. And, and again, you need to know what his out pitch is that day. But um, I'm looking up. Right. So with two strikes, maybe I'm looking up so that I don't chase that slider below. But what does that make me susceptible for his four seam fastball? So you have to figure out, okay, with two strikes, does he typically throw me high fastballs to get me out? Or does he throw me sliders to get me out? Well, maybe you're in a maybe you're in a slump and you're chasing all kinds of sliders, right? What does the scout what does the pitcher scouting report say? Bury this guy with two strikes with sliders. So now I can counteract that and say, I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna look up, look up, and then I'm not gonna chase that slider in the dirt. The more you look for breaking balls, the more you will tend to chase them in the dirt. So when you are you have a plan to look for breaking balls, and I'm a, I'm a proponent of that, depending on the hitter. If I'm a middle-of-the-order guy and I see, uh, you know, 50% breaking balls, typically breaking balls are better to hit than fastballs, especially with less than two strikes. They're just trying to throw them over for strikes, right? They're not trying to put me away. So... You know, you just have to know yourself. You have to understand the game situation. You have to understand what that pitcher has. Then maybe he's not throwing 97 today. Maybe he's at 94. He's at 94. So that tells me, okay, his fastball, he doesn't feel like, he doesn't feel good with the fastball. So he's probably going to increase his breaking ball percentage. And if the breaking ball percentage is there, if he has better feel for the breaking ball, now all of a sudden I'm like, I'm going to look up, I'm going to look up, I'm going to look up. And yes, I'm, once in a while I'm going to get burned with a high fastball and I'm going to probably swing under it if I don't take it. But you know what? I'm going to hit that hanger and I'm not going to chase that ball in the dirt. So that's why we get three strikes. It's it's You can be selective. You can have a plan. You can look in certain windows and certain tunnels and certain um, speeds. Uh, but with two strikes, man, that's a great equalizer. And sometimes when you have somebody with a, a whiff rate of wh whatever you said, 70% balls out of 68% balls out of the zone, that's pretty incredible to me. That that would be a definitely a red flag that pops up that I want to figure out, okay, how can I counteract the swings and misses with two strikes? Okay. And I'm if I could, maybe we strike out looking mm -hmm. once or twice more a game, but maybe six times a game, we don't swing and miss right with balls that are out of the zone and now all of a sudden we've tipped the scales a little bit and maybe we get a couple more walks out of it yeah i'm, I'm glad you brought up whiff rate and if you haven't done so already follow us on social media at jim tara at epstein hitting on both twitter and instagram i pulled up sandy alcantara's numbers from last year 2022 2023 as it pertains to again baseballsavant.com heart swings heart of the plate shadow of the plate right around the plate corner to corner uh north to south top bottom of the zone the chase rate and the waste rate here's what sticks out to me the last two years the waste rate for sandy alcantara five percent last year this year seven percent so this is a guy who is somewhat an of an old school power pitcher mm -hmm. in a new school type game right he doesn't miss too much over the heart of the plate he likes to sort of work around the corners in the shadow of the zone. And as you mentioned in just a couple of seconds ago, he gets a lot of swings and misses and a lot of hitters chase because he tunnels his pitches so well. Mm -hmm. And that makes it tough. And then it's, you know, if you if, if, if he's thrown out of the same arm slot, it's it, it makes it hard, right? That's, yeah, that's why luck. pitchers are doing that now. That's why yeah. pitchers are ahead of the hitters. Um, so then it's going to come down to, to color, right? The ball is a different color depending on the spin, right? A four seam fastball is going to look a little more pink. A slider is going to have a hole in it. Um, a two seamer is going to be a little bit more red. So that's why the first to bat of a game is so important. What does it look like? What, how is it coming out of this player's hand? Um, you know, we're going to face this player multiple, especially, you know, in, in collegiate softball or, or even amateur softball. You know, those, those players will throw multiple times a day. Um, you'll see them multiple times in a tournament. Um, 
you know, especially the late in the year tournaments, you're going to face those aces all the time. So we know them. We know what it's like. And it's, oh, her stuff or his stuff isn't as good as it was last time. Or, ooh, that ball is really jumping jumping out of the hand. So we got to get going. They're going to feel good with the fastball today. So let's make sure our rhythm and timing is, is um, you know, soon enough based on, based on their motion. So I don't know. This is why the game is fun. It keeps you thinking. It keeps it fresh. Every day is different. Even if the pitcher is the same, even if the hitter is the same, the game's different. You know, what's fun too is you're talking there about some, some keys and certain things you could look for as a hitter against a tough pitcher that's you would tell amateurs i mean sandy alcantara is the type of ace that sometimes you just literally have to go back to the basics yeah. and simplify hitting to have a chance and keep in mind again this is a guy that has three pitches fringe fourth pitch with the sinker and you're now having to tell amateur hitters or professional hitters some things you would tell amateur hitters just so you have a chance against Sandy Alcantara because he is that good and he attacks you. He doesn't nibble around the strike zone as we've documented in the numbers today. Mm -hmm. He attacks you and he forces you and challenges you to hit him. Says, here you go. This is what I've got. Now go hit it. Good luck. I'm going to be nibbling the corners. I'm going to be touching 97 with my fastball up, touching 97 with my fastball down, tunneling that with my slider and changer or change up. Yeah. Good luck. And, yeah. I mean, good, yeah, good luck is right. You you have to know your hitters too. You know, we, we, it's a podcast, right? So I'm spewing a lot of information for a plan, right? <laughs> you know, we're tunneling here, we're tunneling there. We're looking for color. We're looking for spin. We're looking for release point, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes you need to know your hitters and some hitters they, that that's just too much information from them. If you just say, Hey, we're looking middle away. Keep your nose down. Don't chase anything up in the zone, right? Pull your helmet down a little bit more, right? Just remind yourself to stay down in the zone, down in the zone, because this is a player that's throwing rise balls or they're throwing four seam fastballs or they're, they're living up in the zone, right? We don't want to chase that stuff. And then other people want to know, hey, okay, okay, their brain can can handle that. Their stress levels can handle that, handle that and they can take advantage of, um, you know, different things. So you have to always talk to your audience. Okay, I've coached different teams with different audiences. Um, and sometimes you need to simplify, which I think is so great. And sometimes people want a little bit more. I, I remember coaching, you know, maybe 30% of the team wanted more. It took me, you know, a month to kind of figure that out. And then some guys wanted a lot of information and some guys wanted to prep on that information. I want to see more breaking balls this week in practice, right? I know how they're going to pitch me. This has been the trend. Okay. And then other people are like, I just kind of want to go look for a good pitch to hit. And I'm totally cool with that too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, until they fail over and over and over again. But if that's the kind of person they are, that's fantastic. You know, I mean, you can look at Manny Ramirez and he used to swing over break. He'd miss a breaking ball his first at bat by two feet. Just so that pitcher filed it away and said, you know, he's looking terrible on breaking balls. And then his next at bat, he would look for breaking balls on every pitch. And then the at bat after that, he would look for breaking balls on every pitch. And when he got the hanger, he capitalized on it. And boom, that was the important part of his game. So sometimes you can be good enough to set set up pitchers, but moreover, you can understand, wow, I looked really bad my first at bat, right? That that pitcher just shoved it. Okay, what can I learn from that? How are they going to pitch me this time? Because it worked last time. They're probably going to attack me the same way. Now I'm going to go ahead and go one step ahead of them. I think that's a great statement. There's a lesson in there, too. A good point with Manny Ramirez. When facing an ace or really any good starting pitcher, but today talking about Sandy Alcantara of the Marlins, when you're facing an ace, you have to think, what did I do wrong in my first at bat or what did I swing and miss at what pitch at my first plate appearance and how can I capitalize on that? Meaning, okay, let me tinker my approach a little bit and let me, like Manny Ramirez did in his career, let me now expect that this guy's going to be pounding the zone with breaking balls or trying to get me to chase that slider that I looked bad mm -hmm. on, that I swung and miss yeah. on, on that pitch in the dirt. That's how you can turn things around in game with your approach when you're facing a really tough pitcher like a Sandy Alcantara, what did he make me look foolish on? What pitch did he make me swing and miss on in that first plate appearance? Mm -hmm. And how could I now use that 
as something that I could do or a piece of information that I could use so I can do damage in my next plate appearance because you know he's going to go back that whoever that pitcher is he's going to yeah. go back to that well yeah. and they always do so if I chased a slider boom that's for strike three I know when I get to two strikes they're going to bury a couple sliders so what am I going to do if I sit there and look for us just a slider and then I'll get excited right there's the slider yeah. Ooh, I'm right oh it's in the dirt, right? I'm going to be overly aggressive on it. So sometimes with two strikes, if you know they're going to bury that stuff because that's the out pitch, that's how they got you last time. Now, all of a sudden, we're looking up, right? We're going to look up a little bit. That's why the two-strike high fastball is so effective, right? Because people are sitting on breaking balls, sitting on breaking balls, and you know, so if you're sitting on breaking ball, you, you know, you want to make sure you're not chasing it down. And then all of a sudden, that fastball comes out and everybody swings under it. So i um, always been a fan of the, the, the high fastball with two strikes. Number one, you're going to get a chase rate, especially at the amateur level. You're going to get a chase rate, you know, probably 50% of the time. Um, and if you don't get a chase, you've moved their eyes. And now you can go, you know, if, if say you throw a high fastball and it's up and away, maybe I go with a low fastball down and in, right? I don't have to throw a breaking ball. I don't have to throw something opposite, but I'm just going to kind of work the box. I'm going to go 180 degrees from where that last pitch, where, the, where their eyes went. Because all of a sudden, if you back up a high fastball, and some people back up high fastballs with breaking balls, right? That's kind of like pitching 101, right? The count's 0 and 2. <laughs> we either throw a fastball six inches off the plate or we throw a high fastball for a chase. Oh, we didn't get a chase. Now I'm going to go ahead and drop a breaking ball off um, after that fastball. But sometimes backing up the fastball with another fastball on the opposite corner of the plate. So if I went up and in with the fastball, they're going to think it's going to be a, a breaking ball low and away. And then all of a sudden I just gas up a pitch on the outside corner of strike three. You can get them most of the time or vice versa from up and away to down and in. So um, it's, again, it's a dance. It's a ballet out there between pitchers and hitters and coaches and uh, catchers calling pitches. It's a game. Well, it's, it's game. important, but it's important to note too. And we talk about this all the time on this podcast about, you have two pitches maybe at the major league level that you can really do damage with in each plate appearance, two pitches, four plate appearances, eight pitches you can do damage with in a game. It's what at hitters prepare for, yeah. right? Yeah. At the most, mm -hmm. it's what hitters prepare for in the batting cage. It's why they do T work. It's why they hit off the iron mic. It's why they do front <laughs> toss. It's why they take batting practice and they take it so seriously so they can do damage on the pitches they can do damage on. <laughs> Correct. And they get eight of them maybe per game. Mind you, though, in-game, that changes. You might take as a hitter fastball right down the heart of the plate. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That that could be a pitch you could have done damage with, but maybe not because you weren't expecting it. You weren't looking for it. You know, your, your father, when he wrote his book, he told a great story. I forget who the hitter was. But a 3-0 count, this hitter took a pitch, fastball right down the middle, strike one. Yeah. Took another fastball right down the middle, strike two. And then later on, I think he might have doubled later in the plate appearance because on that 3-2 pitch, he got a breaking ball. And later on, and this was back in the 70s and 80s, so it just goes to show you for context purposes how much yeah. the game has changed, but how much it really yeah. hasn't changed. That cat and mouse game. Later on, that hitter was asked, why didn't you swing on 3-0? You had the green light. Well, I wasn't looking for that fastball. Why didn't you swing 3-1? and one? You got a fastball right down the middle. He was asked by a teammate, this hitter. Mm -hmm. And he said... I wasn't looking for the fastball. I was mm -hmm. looking for the breaking ball. He got the pitch on three and two mm -hmm. that he was looking for, and he did damage with. So you may take pitches right down the middle, but if you're not looking for that pitch, then you're going to be off balance. You're not going to put a good swing on it. Your swing plane is going to be off, and that's not going to be a good pitch for you to hit, even if it's a fastball center cut. If you're looking yeah. breaking ball in a certain count, that's a pitch you can do damage with. That counts as one of those pitches one of those eight pitches that you can do damage with throughout the game so again when you're facing an ace in my opinion facing any type of pitcher out there that's really really good we've done justin verlander on this show today we're doing sandy alcantara those eight pitches that approach it always has to change from at bat to at bat and understanding and reading what that pitcher is trying to do to you even in the box during that first or second plate appearance yeah, I remember there was another story he told, too, uh, from the other way. And it was, I think it was the 72 playoffs, right before they went to the World Series. And it was a real pressure situation against Detroit. And I think the count was 3-1. and one, 
And the pitching, well, probably was the manager back then, went out to talk to Catfish Hunter was pitching. And it was late in the game or, you know, it was like the eighth inning. And there was a runner on first and they were they were down by uh, or there they, was a tie ball game. And so they go out and they're on the mound and blah, blah, blah. They do the thing. And then um, on the next 3-1 pitch, um, K-Line takes um, a fastball down the middle, like a 3-1 fastball. And my dad's like, I can't believe him. Mean, K-Line's, you know, Hall of Famer, right? He's like, I can't believe he didn't unload on that pitch. And then the next pitch, he threw, a, he threw a slider or something like that. And K-Line rolled into a double play. They got out of the inning and they ended up like going to the World Series. So after the game, they're, they're in the shower and they have a couple beers. And my dad's like, hey, Cat, like what, you know, wh- why did you throw K-Line a fastball right down the middle with a 3-1 count? And he just kind of sits there and he says, I don't know, Mike, I've faced Al whatever. 40 times, he says, I don't think I've ever thrown him a fast or a, a fastball with a 3-1 count. And then, boom, that was the end of the conversation. And it was just he was going back to his own database of information. And now we have that database right on paper or on an iPad. But that's how the game is. And that's why he took that pitch because K-Line's a smart hitter and he was sitting on a breaking ball with a 3-1 count because he knows every time he faces Hunter and he gets the 3-1, he sees a breaking ball. And he wasn't in position to hit it. And they ended up going to the World Series, maybe because of that one pitch that was thrown. So, yeah, you never know what people are thinking. You never know when a pitcher's one step ahead or when you want to go one step ahead. And if you're that kind of that kind of brain and that kind of hitter, um, there's a lot of really good hitters in this world. There's a lot of really – I see great mechanics every single day. Um, I'm doing my draft reports now of, you know – three to 400 amateur players, college and high school. These are the best, very small percentage of them have bad mechanics that aren't easily fixable. If there's one thing when there's 12 year olds and you know, 80% of them have bad mechanics. So that pyramid, right? gets so small at the top, but what are going to make, we're going to give these guys a lot of money in the draft. What is going to make them just a little bit better, right? It's, is it their swing? Is it the way they move? Is it their stride and rhythm? Maybe. Is it their stress level? Is it their approach? Is it their vision? Yes. Um, I remember when Bailey. I Hemphill, underline approach, by the way. What's that? I underline approach. Yeah, approach. You know, I, I remember. Highlight it. Yeah. I got a call from uh, University of Alabama when uh, Bailey Hemphill was still in high school, right? She was like 15 or maybe she was 16. And she was good, right? She's. And the first thing they asked me, I think I've said this before, they're like, you know, what do you, do you think Bailey can play at this level, you know, in the SEC? And I said, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind she can play at this level. And uh, Allie was the one that called. She, she said, well, why? And I said, because when she's in the box, she's cool. And she laughed and she said, what, what does that mean? I want to be cool. I said, nothing bothers her. Like there's players with better swing mechanics. Kind of maybe, but she's relaxed. She's there's no situation that will be too big for her. And we saw that at age 15 and I saw just in the, in the cage, right? Just BP and machines and knowing her personality. And that's the kind of recruit I want to get. I want to get somebody that performs. I don't, I don't need everybody to be a, a freak, you know, to be able to hit balls. You know, if it's softball, hit balls, 300 feet, but I need people that can perform. I need people that can trust what they have. Now, of course, if somebody has a swing issue, then I'm probably not going to recruit that player if it's not fixable, you know, unless I am confident that I can fix it. But if their mechanics are good and maybe they don't hit the ball as far as other people or they're not as physical as somebody, but I like the way that they they approach their at bats. I like the the relaxation. I like the pitches that you know when they get to two strikes, they don't chase as much. You know, all those intangibles make up a great hitter, and I think that's what's important in this game. And that's why in Major League Baseball or Division One softball or wherever you see players of different sizes and shapes, right? Because there's a spot for everybody in this game. You can be five foot eight, and you can. You can use your body correctly, or more importantly, you can be a little bit smarter than everybody else and be successful. Now, if you're bigger and stronger and faster, then you get away with a lot more. But it doesn't mean that you're going to be the best person on the field. And I think that's what's great about this game, too. 
All right, well, great stuff this week, as always. Whether you're facing Catfish Hunter or Sandy Alcantara, biggest thing, have an approach, have a plan, and make it interchangeable and flexible, or else you will never succeed. Um, maybe not never. Maybe you'll in hitting, in, in hitting. I mean, you could succeed in life, which is important, too. Well, I you mean, still I, need to make life, adjustments in life, though. I don't know. There's some things there that carry over to real life. <laughs> Flexibility and, you know. <laughs> Having a plan. Having a plan. Like we have a plan, but sometimes we got to go off script a little bit. We've That's got right. you know recording times, but sometimes we some of us have to be flexible and go off script a little bit, right? That's right. Um, hey, by the way, congrats on the Nuggets. They're almost there. That Mike can I, Malone can we, guy. Good can coach. I call him the Joker now? Can I call him the Joker? Not yet. Wait till they win. You just put the pedal down a little more. I think you need Wait me to score win. some more points. I guess. I'll back down on assist and score a little bit more. No you know, um, Colorado, Denver now is going through what um, what Champa Bay went through. Yeah. All their teams winning. Yeah. Well, Although the Avalanche get, got lucky last year. Let's not get carried away with all of the teams winning. We do have the Broncos and the Rockets. The Broncos, though, now, I mean, they've got some high expectations. I would they think. have high expect. We'll put it that way. They have high expectations. And then, of course, there's the Rockies. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. Right. It all starts beautiful, with ownership. Beautiful ballpark. It is a beautiful team. ballpark, yeah. Good weather, beautiful ballpark. Um, email us, jimbopodcast21, gmail.com. If you want to be a sponsor, email us as well, jimbopodcast21, gmail.com. Email us uh, if you'd like to be a sponsor. Coming up next week, we're going to talk about finding success in hitting sinkers that has become a very tough pitch to hit. Hitting sinkers, Chim Meng Wong comes to mind. Hitting a sinker is like hitting a bowling ball, as it's been <laughs> said. So we're going to be talking about hitting sinkers, how hitters can go about um, mechanically, fundamentally um, hit sinkers, how they can be successful in hitting sinkers and not rolling over. Hint, hint, mm. swing plane. That's a big, mm -hmm. big, big part of it. Um, that is next week, episode 144. Do you have anything before we go? No, sir. Looking forward. That's a good topic, too. We'll, yeah. we'll use uh, Bregman's really good at how he adjusts to different pitches and what guys are trying to throw. So we'll use some of his quotes um, as examples. We will. All right. Very good. We will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe, like the podcast, leave a review. Have a great week, and we will talk to you next Monday. Take care.